All right, cool. Well, then, it is with a uh, great pleasure that I am here to introduce our fantastic keynote speaker. This is Marshall Gans. Uh, Marshall Gans teaches, research, and writes on leadership, narrative, social movements, civic associations, and politics. He grew up in Bakersfield, California. His father was a rabbi and his mother a teacher, and he found his calling as an organizer as part of SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. Then in the fall of 1965, joined Cesar Chavez in his effort to unionize farm workers out in California. He spent 16 years with the UFW, the United Farm Workers, gaining experience in union, political, and community organizing. So um, while uh, Mr. Gans is an academic as well, he is also the real deal. He's done a lot of work in the field. He became the director of organizing and was elected to the National Executive Board of the United Farm Workers, where he served for eight years. During the 80s, he worked with grassroots groups to develop new organizing programs. He designed innovative voter mobilization strategies for electoral campaigns, including in 2000. 2007 and 2008, when he helped design the grassroots organizing approach that the Obama campaign used for their presidential run. Today, he coaches, trains, and advises on organizing, training, and leadership development around the world. He's the senior lecturer in leadership, organizing, and civil society at Harvard's Kennedy School of Government. This is a man who's done a lot and has a lot of experience. He's well known in organizing circles, and we're super honored to welcome Marshall Gans to speak with us today. Take it away, Marshall. <clears throat> thank you, Simon. Thanks so much. And, and thanks to everyone. Wait, I've got to fix this. It keeps going off gallery. And gallery is important so that I can see people. Um, let me see here. What, what just happened? We got switched off gallery. Marshall, you can still put it back in gallery if you go to the right hand corner at the top and say view, and then you can click there. Gallery. Yeah, everybody's back. Yeah, and no, uh, thank you. Uh, and good morning, good afternoon. I guess it's the borderline right now. Uh, but I do want to ask everyone if they wouldn't mind turning on their screens. I find it's much more helpful to have a conversation with people than with black rectangles, uh, and as lovely as they might be, uh, because it, uh, well, it's different. And it's helpful to me to see who I'm talking to. And I think it's helpful for people to see each other. Uh, and that is possible on Zoom. So I uh, want to ask you to, uh, to please do that. Um, but I want to thank you for the opportunity to work with you uh, today, because uh, you've been on the front lines of battle um, for a long time. And it's a battle that's only grown more intense, more challenging, more critical and at the same time, more critical, more vital to win. Um, so I'm looking forward to the conversation that we have today, more as a mutual learning uh, than, you know, like somebody, you know, preaching a lecture, uh, it's not the idea. And what we're learning about is about this work of leadership, of organizing, of action, uh, and and how it how it happens and, and how you get it done. And, I, I do feel a little bit like I'm bringing Coles to Newcastle here because you folks have been at it for a long time. And that's uh, really much to be honored and appreciated uh, because it's, it's, not, it's not typical. Uh, and, and in a context in which, as I say, it really, really matters. The, the approach that I take to leadership and organizing, because I think of organizing as a form of leadership is rooted in three questions posed by a first century Jerusalem scholar, Rabbi Hillel, who when asked, how do I figure out what to do with my life? Responded with three questions to ask yourself. And the first question, if I am not for myself, who will be for me? Now, it's not meant to be a selfish question. It is meant to be a self-regarding question. In other words, if you presume to lead others, you better be clear about what you bring to it, what you expect from it, and have a level of self-awareness that you can actually see others. And that starts with being clear about yourself. But then the second question he says to ask is, if I am for myself alone, what am I? Because to be a who and not a what, a person, not a thing, is to recognize that we're relational creatures. We exist in relationship with others in the world. Our capacity to realize our objectives is inevitably wrapped up with the capacity of others to realize theirs. Uh, and finally, third question he says to ask yourself is, if not now, when? Uh, it's not advice to jump into moving traffic. It's more of a caution against what Jane Adams described as the snare of preparation. 
just another year of strategic planning. We'll have the perfect plan, then we'll go implement it, and the world will totally conform to our expectations. I don't know if that's ever happened to you. It's never happened to me. The point is that rarely can we learn to do well what we need, what we want to do until we begin to do it. In other words, that understanding flows from action, uh, not preceding it. And, and so for me, leadership is about the interaction of these three elements of self with other, with action and how they uh, operate together. Now, a second point though, is that if you think about what the domain of leadership is, uh, perhaps you've had the experience and when, when things are going really great in a campaign or in your organization, people say, where's the leadership so I can thank them? It might happen, but usually when do you hear, hey, who's in charge here? Who decided that? Is it when everything's going great? You can unmute and respond. Is it when everything's going great? I see some heads shaking, no. No, and, and see, there's some real, really important point there, which is that when the system is working fine, what do we need leadership for? It's, it's the, the dilemmas, the contradictions, the challenges, the unexpected, that's where the adaptive and creative uh, capacity for leadership really, really matters. And so in other words, there never will be this time when quote, everything's under control. Uh, that's an illusion, will never happen not if you're functioning in a leadership role. And so, you know, it, it, that's daunting because, you know, you'll ask yourself, do I have the skills to deal with these new challenges? And that's a, a challenge to the hands. And can I use my resources in new ways? Uh, a strategic challenge, a challenge to the head. And then there's, um, where do I get the hope? Where do I get the courage? How do I inspire the hope and courage in others that it takes to often take the risks that are involved in confronting real change. And that's a challenge to the heart. So it's a way of thinking about leadership in a head, hands, heart kind of way. And the, the definition that I've come to use for leadership is this, that it's about accepting responsibility because there's a choice, accepting responsibility for enabling others to achieve shared purpose under conditions of uncertainty. In other words, this is not leadership as a diva, you know? This is not leadership as the sun that you know, sheds light or heat or whatever if you get too close. Or it, it's not that idea. It's the idea that leadership is enabling effective shared purpose, collective action under conditions of uncertainty. That's really what it's about. And thinking of it that way, it's, it's leadership, not so much as a position, as a practice, uh, a way of doing things, uh, not, not sort of, well, I, I think we can probably think of all, I'll think of some examples of people that occupy positions of formal leadership that turn out to be pretty awful leaders. I don't know if you can think of any examples, any recent examples, you can certainly think of a few. Uh, on the other hand, I think it's also true that we meet people in workplaces, in communities, at kitchen tables, who are exercising leadership in the way I'm describing it, without the titles, without the designations, without the formal authority, but are nevertheless enabling others to achieve shared purpose by working with them. So it's thinking of leadership in, in that way uh, as a practice. It's also less leadership about knowing, you know, having all the answers uh, as it is about learning. Because anytime you act into the future, you're entering the unknown. And so unless you're learning, all the time as the world changes, as we change, well, then, you know, you know, it's, uh, it's not leadership anymore. And so it's sort of these two things about as a practice and as learning, I think is really fundamental. Now, organizing, uh, as I learned it, is a form of leadership in which the question is not what is my issue, but who are my people? In other words, with who are the people with whom I'm entering into this relationship? Because thinking of leadership this way, it's more of a relationship than it is a performance. You know, it's not on the stage performing, it's a way of entering into relationships with people. And in organizing, so first question, who are my people? And then second question, what are the challenges they face in terms of their lived experience, their reality? not because I figured it out somewhere and I'm gonna go now and tell them you know, what their problems are. 
it, it's, it's rooted in lived experience. And finally, it's, it's about enabling others, enabling others to, to turn their resources into the power that they need in order to get what they want. So it is about people, it's about change, and it's about power. And it's about how those three interact with each other. And um, just one other point I want to make about, about organizing in particular. Well, it's not, it's not about providing services to clients, which is a nice thing, um, but not organizing. Uh, it's not about marketing products to customers, uh, which is also fine, but not organizing. It's not even about advocating for others, but not organizing. It's about, it's about, it's about, it's about building a constituency. And, and the word comes from the Latin con stare, which means to stand together. It's about bringing people together, to stand together, to learn together, to decide together, to act together, and hopefully to win together. And that's what sets organizing apart. And that's why it's so fundamental to the practice of democracy itself, which is itself an effort to find a way to enable people to work together to achieve shared purpose as remote as that may seem at this moment. Uh, so when we do organizing, we're actually building the foundation for a functioning democracy. And I think that's what you've been doing in your organization uh, for many years. I understand there was a controversy this morning. There was a vote, uh, you know, and there was a decision and nobody ran away. That's democracy, it's to have enough of a common foundation and a commitment to each other and to shared values that we can disagree uh, and yet continue to work together. I, I think James Baldwin had a good way of saying it. He said that, uh, he says that we can argue uh, and I can still love you uh, if what we're arguing about is not my humanity or my right to exist. So there are of course boundaries and those boundaries are the values that link us to one another. Now, organizing is also about power. And that's a very important element. And, you know, that word, tend to, you know, say power, people tend to kind of like, ooh, you know, power, ooh, that's scary. Uh, you know, Dr. King defined power simply as the, the, the ability to achieve purpose. Uh, in Spanish, poder just means to be able to. And we, we have an intuitive understanding of it. Like, if you need what I've got more than I need what you've got, who's got the power? Point to me or point to yourselves. You need what I've got more than I need what you've got. Who's got the power, me or you? Come on, let's see those, yeah, yeah. And now if we flip it around and I need what you've got more than you need what I've got, who's got the power? See, it's intuitive. It's really how it's worked, how it worked because power is not a thing you have, it's a relationship. It is a relationship between needs and resources. And, and it's so important to understand it, that to see it that way. It's not something you possess. It is a kind of relationship you have with others, institutions, other people, other organizations and whatnot. And when we have a common interest, then we can collaborate with one another where we have more or less common interests and some relative equality through collaboration, we can create more power, more power with one another like a co-op, a co-op daycare, a co you know, a credit union. On the other hand, when resources that we need are held by others, then we have to figure out how to use our resources uh, in respect to their needs so that they need what we've got. Uh, and, you know, there's a saying in Spanish, al no pal no se viene a ver solo cuando tiene tuna, which means people come to look at the prickly pear cactus only when it's bearing fruit which is used to describe the politicians showing up in the barrios just before election time. All of a sudden, there's a resource that matters. And so they show up. And so that creates leverage. And so it's understanding this core dynamic, which is really what it requires to create the kinds of change that we often need. Because sometimes it's obvious who has the power, like when George Floyd was murdered and you saw the picture. On the other hand, you also have to ask who authorized that? Who decided that that was okay? That's a second place of power. And then sometimes, you know, it just goes on and on and nobody questions it. And it's just how it is. 
And to, to find that out, you have to say, well, who's benefiting and who's losing from this current situation? And you'll discover who holds power. And in organizing, very often, it's trying to tackle that most obvious level, but in such a way that it builds the power to deal with the deeper structural levels, if that makes sense. In Montgomery, Alabama, the modern civil rights movement started with a boycott of buses. It wasn't like, now we're going to end institutionalized racism. But by doing it, not through a lawsuit, but through organizing, they built a powerful foundation that launched a movement. And so it's how do we combine these things that we're addressing the immediate, but in such a way that builds the power to deal with the structural challenges. And finally, uh, we evaluate an outcome in organizing as not just did we, you know, did we pass the law? We also have to say, are we more powerful as an organization walking away from this? And I don't know if you've ever had the experience of winning a campaign, but you never ever want to see anybody again who was involved. Uh, maybe that's only in Massachusetts that happens or, I, yeah. Well, it's sort of you won, but you also lost because you may have gotten that particular thing, but you lost your power because, because it's disintegrated. And so the second outcome is we are a more powerful organization. And the third outcome is we have developed more leadership because leadership is what it takes to build organizing and organization. And so we look at it in terms of those three outcomes. Now, this organizing I've just been describing uh, was uh, um, my introduction to it came in 1964 when I was a junior at Harvard College and volunteered for the Mississippi Summer Project. And the Summer Project was an effort to support the work of uh, black organizers in Mississippi who, when they were trying to organize, were getting put in jail or beaten or worse because the law didn't protect them. And so the idea was to bring folks from the North whom the law, who might bring the law with them, like students from white students from colleges, as well as black students from places like Howard and so forth. And that way bring the law to Mississippi. And the, the mission was to organize something called the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party, which was to be a, a, an integrated parallel structure to the official Democrats who were who were racially uh, excluded, uh, exclusive, and, and then go to the Atlantic City Democratic Convention and challenge them and seat ours. And that was kind of the idea. Uh, we were in a place called Oxford, Ohio, just uh, the night before it was time to go to Mississippi. And we got word that three of our party had disappeared. Uh, Andrew Goodman, Michael Schwerner, and James Cheney. Uh, they had uh, gone down a, a week before to investigate the burning of a black church in Philadelphia, Mississippi. Uh, where there'd been civil rights work and hadn't been heard from since. Bob Moses, who was the lead organizer appropriately named, uh, called us all together like in an auditorium. And he was a very soft-spoken guy. Uh, he actually passed away just, just a few weeks ago. Uh, he called us all together and he got up on the stage. He said, we heard what happened to our brothers and we don't know what happened, but we think they're gone. And sure enough, their, their bullet riddled beaten bodies were found buried in a dirt levee where the Klan had taken them, had buried them after executing them when the county sheriff turned them over to the Klan. Now, we didn't know that, but we kind of knew that. And so Bob said, look, I'd like to tell everybody, just, just forget about it. Just, you know, go home. But I can't. I have to ask you to go. But I can't take the whole responsibility. He said, everybody here has got to decide. And if you decide you can't go, there's no shame. It's just everybody's got to decide. Well, I sunk into my chair. It was just utter silence in that room. What did we get ourselves into? What is this really about? And you ask yourself those questions. You know, we lived in Germany for three years after the Second World War. My father was a chaplain in the American army. And a lot of his work was with Holocaust survivors. And my fifth birthday party was actually in a, what were called DP camps, displaced person camp of all children where I was supposed to give gifts rather than getting them, which was a little hard to understand until they got the point that it was a children's camp because the parents were gone. And so the Holocaust was a reality in, in, in our home, but my parents interpreted it to me as not being simply about anti-Semitism, but about racism and that racism kills. You turn people into objects, you can do, you can do whatever, you can do anything to them. And the civil rights movement was challenging the institutionalized racism that's been part of this country since before its founding. Now, I don't know, are there any PKs here? You know what a PK is? Any preacher's kids? No? 
Oh, oh there's one in Anna. What kind, Anna? What was that? What kind? What kind of preacher? Uh, Methodist. Oh, okay. All right. Any others? Yeah, I'm a I'm a child of a Methodist preacher. He was from Boston, um, came out to Oregon in 1957. And then I'm also a retired United Methodist pastor and got kids of my own. All right. So you, you produced some PKs as well. <laughs> yeah, both yeah, sides. No, no, it's it's kind of a it's kind of a special deal. It's like our case are kind of in the same category, rabbi's kids or imam's kids for that matter. It's like, you know, you got to go to all the stuff, right? Uh, you're also supposed to be perfect, which is a different set of issues that we could have a support group about. But uh, but I love the Passover Seder, which was the telling of the Exodus story with food, uh, which was good. But that journey from slavery to freedom, and they would point to the kids and say, you were slaves in Egypt. And I'd say, I don't get this. I've never been a slave, never been to Egypt. It took a while to understand what it meant was that that story was not the property of one people or time or a place. It's told generation after generation. You have to figure out where you are in it. Are you with those guys with the horses and the chariots? Or you with the people who are trying to find their way to a land of promise? Well, Dr. King described the civil rights movement as yet another chapter in that story, in the Exodus story. And, um, you know, as you're, as you're thinking about these things, I mean, you know, I was 20 at the time, others were 18, 19, 21, civil rights movements moving to young people. And Walter Brueggemann, a Protestant theologian, wrote a book called The Prophetic Imagination, where he says that that transformational vision occurs at the intersection of two things. One he calls criticality, a clear view of the world's hurt, of its pain, of its need, coupled with hope, a sense of its promise and its possibilities. And young people come of age with a critical eye on the world they find and almost of necessity hopeful hearts. So there's a, a deep affinity between generation change and social change. And it was that way for my generation. I believe it is for this one as well. And as we're sitting there in silence, a young woman named Jean Wheeler stands up in the back. She starts to sing. They say that freedom is a constant struggle. They say freedom is a constant struggle. Oh Lord, we've struggled so long, we must be free. Say that freedom is a constant dying. We've died too long. We must be free. And as she stood up and began to walk out of the room, everyone piled in behind her. And the next day, everybody went to Mississippi. Now, for me, that was a turning point in my life because it was in Mississippi that my education about race, power, and politics in America, with all due respect to Harvard, would begin. It was so evident. It was so obvious, the inequalities in housing, healthcare, education, but it was also clear that bringing a few books or medical supplies wouldn't, wouldn't solve the problem. You'd feel good because you brought it, but would it change anything? And that's when I learned the difference between charity and justice and that charity says, what's wrong, let me help. Justice says, why is it happening, let me change it. And when you ask that question, people get uncomfortable because you often find that these people don't have enough because these people have too much. And you start trying to upset that deal and you get resistance and you find yourself in a power struggle. And so then, you know, you say, well, where do we go for power? And a lot of people said, go to Washington DC, the government will fix this. Well, that didn't, that didn't turn out. It's more, we need more research. And it became clear that unless the people with the problem were also the solution, it just wasn't gonna change. Nobody had an interest, but they didn't have any power. African-Americans couldn't vote. Uh, at the time, uh, had no economic protections like uh, uh, under the labor laws. I'd never been in a setting where I'd walk up to someone twice my age who would stand up, offer me his chair, call me Mr. and, not inter and introduce himself with his first name and not look me in the eye because he was black and I was white, went on thousands of times a day across the South. So no power. Well, it turned out there's a difference between resources and power. And the lesson was the Montgomery bus boycott where you know, after the Supreme Court said uh, segregation was unconstitutional, in Montgomery, the buses had blacks in the back, whites in the front, no man's land in the middle, armed deputized bus driver. And you had to, if you were a black person, you had to walk past all that, find a seat in the back. And if a white person wanted the seat, you had to get up and give it to them twice a day, twice a day. Just imagine the anger in that community about that. And so when Brown was willed, they said, oh, let's uh, maybe what we can do is file a lawsuit. We need a plaintiff. That was Rosa Parks, who everybody's heard of. But the lawsuit wasn't enough because that night the Women's Committee at the Black College said, we gotta show solidarity with Rosa Parks. Let's all stay off the buses for one day. 
And that Monday morning is a great account of Dr. King looking at the buses go by and there isn't a single black face on a single bus. That night, that community saw itself differently. Um, you know, power, powerlessness fragments you and, and empowerment unites you. And so that night they decided they would stay off those buses until they won, took a year and they did win. Now, what they discovered was they all had a resource that could become a source of power. Well, what was that? What was that? Turns out they all had feet. And if they used their feet to walk to work instead of, and, and deny the bus company the bus fare, instead of getting on the bus, giving the bus company the bus fare, they could turn their individual dependency on the bus company into the bus company's dependency on the community as a collective, as a whole, a united community. Well, that was kind of cool. And that was called organizing, developing leadership, uh, uh, enabling people to uh, turn their resources into the power that they need to build community and turn that community into a source of power. So when it came time to go back to school, it seemed completely irrelevant. Um, I wrote him a letter, how can I come back and study history when we're busy making it, which was arrogant, but also true. And that's when I returned to Bakersfield, California, where I grew up, and Cesar Chavez had just started organizing migrant farm workers. And you know, I grew up in the middle of the farm worker world, but I hadn't seen it. I had to go to Mississippi and get what we called Mississippi eyes to see another community of people of color, also without political rights, also without economic protections. And California with its own rich history of racial discrimination, going back to the native peoples, to the Chinese, to the Japanese and so forth. And it turned out that Mississippi was really more of, wasn't an exception to America. It was an example of the America we needed to change. So I began working with Caesar did that for the next 16 years, which is really where I learned the craft of organizing. And I call it a craft. It was taught that way. It wasn't just like being one with the people. Uh, and it, I was so fortunate that it was approached in that way. Uh, and we had to do political organizing, community organizing, workplace organizing across many different cultures uh, from which people had come to work uh, in the fields uh, in California. Um, I left the farm workers in 1981, did another 10 years of union issue and electoral work, mostly in California, and then was invited to my 25th reunion at Harvard. Um, now, I was surprised I was a dropout. I didn't know they invited dropouts. I understood there was a dropout up in Seattle. I could understand inviting that guy because, you know, he did fairly well, but that wasn't me. Uh, but I decided to go and, and I ran into a 20 year old me, 20 year old version of me there. How's it going? I'm feeling stuck. Reagan's been president. Pray. I don't know. I, I'm feeling stuck. Why don't you come back and finish that senior year? You never did. Well, I don't know. Synapses may not work. You know, uh, tuition had changed a little bit, uh, but we, we figured it out. So 1991, I came back, finished my senior year in history and government, wrote a senior thesis and graduated class of 64 92. And my 81 uh, year old mother got to come and see her son finally, finally become a college graduate. So I got to close that particular loop. But I got the bug, did a master's then at the Kennedy School and then a PhD in sociology. And while working on the PhD was asked to design a course on organizing. That was a gift because it was a place I could integrate my life experience in social science. I was learning in a conversation with a rising generation. It was kind of like, I get to go to class twice a week and have a conversation with the future. How cool is that? How cool is that for everybody? And so I've been on the faculty full-time since 2000, I teach organizing online and offline, public narrative online and offline, and, uh, and back into the world of practice, mainly through my students, especially with the Obama campaign in 2007, uh, where we were involved in, in design of the, of the grassroots program. And since then, working with people in different parts of the world who, who want to figure out how to turn their values into sources of power that they need in order to create a world into which they want their children to live. So, that's where this stuff comes from. So let me take now the remaining time to sort of sketch out an approach to organizing very specifically, because we come to teach it in the form of five practices. And, and by a practice, I mean a skill, but it's also a, a conceptual understanding of that skill. And it's also a set of values that are implicit in the skill. And so that's why I call them practices. The first one is relationship building. And you know, these days there's so much transactional stuff going on uh, where people are being reduced to data points, being reduced to objects of different kinds. 
it's not trivial to say that relationship building really matters because the source of power in organizing is the commitments people make to each other. That, that's what the power is. And so the building of relationship is absolutely fundamental. Uh, and we can talk more about that, the role it has, how you get to scale with it. But without that as the bedrock, it's not organizing, it's mobilizing. And there's a lot of mobilizing that goes on of, you know, turn out for this rally, turn out for this thing, but nothing is built, nothing is constructed. It's a bunch of bodies in one place. I had a long talk with Wild Bonim, who was the Google guy during the Tahrir Square, uh, uh, you know, demonstrations, and they did a wonderful job of mobilizing, but they didn't organize. And as a result, the folks with the organization walked away with the power. Uh, so relationship building. Second is storytelling. And by storytelling, what I mean is, it's the heart work. It's how we turn the emotional resources embedded in our values into the courage that we need in order to confront disruptive disruptions, deep disruptions, and, and, and that, that, may, uh, that appear to us as threats from which we flee, uh, we become isolated, we, that cause self-doubt, into challenges that we can embrace with hope, with solidarity, and with a sense of belief in ourselves. That's kind of what stories do, because stories are all built about a particular moment in which a protagonist is confronted with a challenge. They have to respond, there's an outcome, and we call the outcome a moral. And that's how we learn. And it's how we, our faith traditions teach, it's how our cultures teach, it's how we teach our children. And you ask people, why, why are you telling all those stories? And they'll say, well, keep them busy. Yeah, but why are you telling them? Well, to instruct. Well, just give them a list. Do this, don't do that. Doesn't work. When you tell the story, the person can identify emotionally with what's going on in that story. And so it becomes an emotional memory, not simply a memory in the head. It becomes a moral taught to the heart. And it becomes in that way a resource for us and we have these experiences ourselves in our own lives. We have those experiences in which we learn to care, uh, often hurtful. Those experiences in which we learn to hope, hope so it gave us some sense of efficacy. I mean, frankly, if you hadn't had experiences of hurt, you wouldn't think the world needed us. And if you had had experiences of hope, you wouldn't think you'd care. So almost everybody here has got both. Marshall, I think you got muted somehow. Yeah, I was probably probably going over time. So that was kind of the... No, you were not going over time. You were <laughs> talking about hope. Please continue the thought. Was yeah, no, I was just saying we have those experiences in our own lives, those moments in which we learn to care, those moments in which we found hope. And and that becomes our resource of stories from which we can teach others and which we can learn. And so when we talk about using narrative in leadership, it's like how we can recall those moments and share them so that people can get us. We call that a story of self. Uh, it's not a resume. It's, not, it's, it's those life experiences that can communicate to others why, why we care, why we're hopeful. And then uh, to bring alive moments shared by those with whom we engage, we call that a story of us, moments of shared values not a category us, but a shared experience us. And then the current moment, a moment of urgent challenge. What's our source of hope? What are the choices we're required to make now? So story work is an answer to the question, not how, but why. Why does it matter? Why do we care? And it is to speak the language of emotion, which may sound weird, but we speak the language of emotion in music. We speak it in worship. We speak it at a, at a, after, after a ball game in a ball game, we speak the language of emotion. It's not just crazy irrational, it is a form of language that moves us. St. Augustine said, it's one thing to know the good, another to love it. Loving it is what enables action on it, the motivation. The next practice is strategizing. Um, and if, if story is about the why, then strategy is about the how. Uh, strategy is how to turn what we have into what we need to get what we want. And just like relationship building and storytelling, we are all also natural strategists. Everybody builds relationships, not necessarily good ones. Everybody builds relationships. Everybody tells stories. And we strategize every time we overslept and missed the bus to get wherever it was and still have to figure out how to get there. 
So these are not otherworldly skills or practices. They're things we do. And a lot of what we do in learning is to take something we know implicitly, make it explicit. And that way we can bring craft, intentionality, and purpose to it. And that's what we do in organizing training. Uh, so strategize, and, we, and strategy as a verb, not as a noun, not something you have, something you do, because I've never seen that perfect plan. I mean, if you're not constantly reassessing where you are, what are you learning, what's working, what's not working, then your strategy just dies. So it's a verb, not a noun. And I, I love word or, origins. I mean, it comes from the Greek, uh, strata is the word for field. And uh, the army was called a strata because it took the field. Uh, the general was called a strategos who went and was on top of the hill, developed a theory of how to win the battle. Uh, the soldiers met down in the valley, they were called tacticas. And they were the ones who actually had to do the fighting. And that's where we get strategy and tactics. And the challenge is to combine the view from the mountaintop and the view from the valley. And often what happens is the folks in the valley think they have the whole truth. Well, they have part of it. Or the one on the mountaintop think they got the whole truth. Well, they have part of it. And the reality is they have to be put together. And that's often a real challenge in, in organizing. Uh, the fourth, and I'll just, I've got my 30 second sign here. So I'm gonna just take an extra minute or two. Uh, the fourth uh, practice is action which means when I was taught organizing, I was told if you can't count it, it didn't happen. In other words, the actual deployment of resources, the actual mobilization and deployment of resources, time, money, votes, whatever, it's the real change on the ground. It's not enough to say our strategy is we'll have a general meeting. Oh, and five people show up. Well, guess what? Not so good. The science of getting 50 people, not five to show up, and it is a science, it, it gets right down to those details of reminder calls and all of that. You know, I find that attention to detail is an expression of love for what you're doing because the details make the difference. When somebody comes in and says, well, don't bother me with the details, I'll say, well, don't bother me at all because you have no appreciation for what makes excellence in what we do. And that reminder call, that really matters. Getting that commitment really matters. And so action then, thinking of, are we building from people, money, uh, where's our... Finally, the last, the last thing on this I wanna mention is structure. And because structure is one of those words that people often just like uh, kind of, I don't want structure, I hate structure. Um, and it's, we, a lot of us have pretty negative experience with structures that kind of, uh, they, they, they stifle, they, they don't allow us to innovate, to change. Uh, on the other hand, sometimes we're so reactive that we say we want no structure. And so then you have what Joe Freeman calls the tyranny of structurelessness. I don't know if you've ever been in one of those setups where, well, you know, who's deciding? Well, well did we decide that? Did that really, I, I hope you haven't had this experience, you may have. And it turns out decisions are getting made, but off the books, nobody knows who's making those decisions. It's, it's not transparent, it's confusing. And so structure, if you just think about it for a moment, what it, the word means to build. So building structure, structuring is a hopeful thing because it's building for the future. And all it consists of is the commitments we make to each other about how we're gonna work together. It enables coordination, it enables collaboration. Otherwise it's just everybody on their own. And so that's all it is, commitments about how we make decisions about how we hold ourselves accountable, uh, about uh, uh, time and so forth. And so, uh, you know, many organizations really struggle with this. I don't think yours has. And I think that's a real blessing uh, because I'm doing some work with Sunrise and they struggle with it a whole lot. Uh, so structuring, but structuring in a way that develops leadership that's responsive. And, and really then all these kind of come together in campaigns, which you're very familiar with, ways of building resources that you need to win as you build, as you do the campaign. In other words, it's not like waiting for a grant and then you start. So, uh, and, and the, the final thought here is that all of this really is also based on a notion of leadership that is not the one person telling everybody what to do, uh, which turns out not to work. Uh, we've been working mostly with leadership teams uh, and leadership teams that are collaborative, and each member of which can build their own team, 
and so forth. And it can be a kind of cascading form of leadership structure in which learners become teachers, in which followers become leaders. Uh, and it's an alternative to that traditional one guy telling everybody, yeah, it's usually a guy telling everybody what to do. Uh, some people call it the snowflake approach, but it, it's sort of based on the notion that power in organizing depends on deep leadership, deep leadership, so that the capacity for strategizing, for motivation, for action is distributed widely, not just held by a few people at the center. So let me just stop there. I'm over time a little bit. And, and let me just, let's just open it up for, for questions, comments, concerns. That was sort of what I just covered usually takes a semester. So uh, that was uh, a condensed version. Uh, a little bit was lost in that. But let's open it up. Who's got some thoughts, challenges, questions, comments? Well, that was uh, wonderful, Marshall. Thank you so much for, for all of that. And uh, what Caitlin and I sort of had in mind for questions is if you want to either use the, well, actually, probably the best thing would be if you can type into the chat that you have a question, we'll sort of, call, Caitlin and I will keep stack and call on people as they uh, sign in. I don't believe we have, I don't actually know that we have anyone joining us by phone. So I think everyone hopefully has access to that chat bar. And it looks like Olivia, uh, our valiant former director has the first question. Olivia, speak up. Thank you. Thanks, that was so interesting. I loved it. I love, I love, love, love learning more and more about organizing and your stories. Okay, I just, I missed one word, I think, and I just want to fill in my notes. You said, what is, you said something is criticality paired with hope. Oh, yeah. This is um, prophetic imagination uh, oh, or transformational okay. vision is, and Brueggemann's book is really, it's really good, actually. Uh, he goes from Moses to Jesus. Uh, he covers a rather broad territory, but he's talking about criticality seeing, knowing, feeling the world's hurt, but at the same yeah. time, accessing the hope. And see, when I say hope, I, let me, I don't mean flowers in May, everything. There's a definition of hope that uh, Maimonides, 12th century philosopher had, which was that hope is belief in the plausibility of the possible, as opposed to the necessity of the probable. In other words, to be a realist is to recognize it is always probable Goliath will win but sometimes David does, that it was utterly improbable that a black man, we'd elect a black man president of this country in 2007, it happened. It's that sense of the possible between fantasy and between certainty. That's kind of where hope lies. And we have experiences of that in our own lives. And so it's, it's cultivating that sense of possibility of imagination of could be. Uh, and to me, that's what's meant by hope. I hope from us what could be. And Thank Mark, you. I believe there was a question. Who was that you were quoting about? Um, hope is the. Oh, uh, oh th that was Maimonides. Uh, Mo uh, Moses Maimonides is 12th century uh, uh, scholar from Cordoba in Spain uh, and sort of a, a, a classic uh, Jewish scholar uh, who had some really interesting philosophical takes. And that view on hope, I think, really nails it. I think it's a very, very good one. And Larry Bean, I believe you have a question. Larry, you might be muted. Yeah, couldn't find my, my unmute. Yeah, that's just a layman's question, but I, I guess in my life, uh, people that I consider good leaders, one of the qualities that seem almost universal is an uncanny memory of people's names. And uh, just, just comment on that for me, my, my take on my observation. Yeah, well, you know, it's, it's Larry, it's, it's about relationship, isn't it? It's about, you know, you know what respect. Uh, we did some interesting work with mayors last year during the George Floyd stuff, and we we're trying to figure a foundation to base it on. And we thought respect, that's pretty interesting if you think about respect. Because if you reflect on your own experiences, of disrespect and how that feels and respect and how that feels, it seems to boil down to just three things. One is being seen. 
another one is being heard, and the other one is being valued. And we communicate that to others or we don't. And when, you know, what you're describing, like remember people's names, it's being seen. It's a sign of respect. It's, it's a sign of value. And so I think we communicate that all the time. And it's pretty easy to tell when that politician is just, you know, you're just another face. Um, now, now, you may not have super memory, you know, but there's something about really paying attention to people. And I think people know when you're paying attention to them and when you're seeing them and when you're not. Thanks, Larry. What else? I believe Bill Milton has a question. Yeah, th thanks. Uh, and yeah, thanks for the wonderful presentation. Uh, how, would, how would you uh, respond or give advice <laughs> to the increasing reports of young people in the world in the face of climate change <laughs> actually moving to, to anxiety and even despair and losing the capacity to respond? And, you know, in my, in, you know, in all of our roles in organizing our communities, I am quite excited about a lot of young people I'm working with. But this increasing uh, acknowledgement of a large amount of young people that are really, really having trouble dealing with uh, some of these existential threats is going to be really important uh, to respond to in a positive way. And I'm just curious. You know, in this day and age, I mean, back doing the great things you were doing, uh, you were in your 20s, I mean, civil rights, if you were right into it and you were a black person, I suppose it was just an ongoing historic existential crisis. But this one that's so overwhelming, it's applying to all ethnic groups, to all of us. Do you have thoughts on um, yeah. how to respond to that? Yeah, Bill, I, it's one reason why I decided to do work with Sunrise because uh, those are young people who are highly committed and who are you know, drawing on their hope to deal with the fear, uh, to deal with the anxiety you're describing. And I think, you know, how can I say, it is through action, it is through engagement, it is through actually doing stuff uh, that, the, that, that that despair can go away. But of course, you've got to have enough hope to get people into action. And so I think the kind of work that they've been doing and others, not just them. I mean, if you look around the world at the youth foundation for so much of the commitment to dealing with the climate crisis, it's, it's their future, you know, it's their world uh, that's at stake. And so I think the, the challenge all of us have is to take it as seriously uh, and is to show, to model what it's like to keep fighting and to act with hope and to not despair. And I, I don't say those words lightly because I, you know, the world's a tough place. And uh, I always, uh, I like uh, uh, in, in the gospel of Matthew 10, 16, where uh, Jesus is gonna send his disciples out to deliver the, tell the story. And he says, if I'm gonna put you as sheep among wolves, you must be innocent as doves and wise as serpents. And preserving the innocence, but coupling with the wisdom is kind of where it's at, I think. And so I love working with young people. It's, it's the thing that I think is where I get my hope. You know, because uh, I look out, you know, I have 130 students right now here at Kennedy School. I have another 130 online. They're from about 25 different countries. And it's just, it's generative. Do I have the answers? No, do they have the answers? The answers are to engage in the fight and there you go. That's the only way you find them. It's the only way I know of that you find them. So I don't know, Bill, if that's responsible. Uh, that, that was great. No, I, I totally concur. It's just how to do that better. Yeah, that's it. That's what you gotta do. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And I believe uh, it's, is it Jill uh, who has our next question? Yes, Jill. Yeah. Um, Thank you. I, I had uh, the privilege in 1971, 1972, to, to work in Mississippi as the aide to Robert Clark, who uh, was the first uh, 
elected to the Mississippi legislature, first black man elected to the Mississippi legislature. From which, from which county was that? Holmes County in Chula. Oh, from Holmes County. That's the first place I worked was in Holmes County. Exactly. And I and so I, yeah. I, I was able to meet a lot of the people that I'm sure that you had uh, first worked with. And I really thank you at how, uh, how wonderful your work, you know, to be able to uh, elect somebody from there to the Mississippi legislature was phenomenal. That's, uh, Hart, uh, Hart, Hartman Turnbull. I don't know Hart, if he was- Hartman, Hartman Turnbull, yeah. uh, Mr. Bailey. <laughs> um, oh gosh, I have to remember those names. But Henry Lorenzi, I wonder if you had ever run into him, Henry Lorenzi, because he was an organizer down there in those days, maybe following when you first went there. Uh, but he gave me my first sort of lesson in organizing your stuff. He said, normalize from reality. Normalize from reality. Now explain that. Well, he was a physicist by training. Yeah. And when you're working in a laboratory, the first thing you have to do is you have to set your instruments at zero. Yeah. And then, you know, you've got to have a vision. But yeah. you've got to know yeah, what is reality. Yeah, but after I walked along, that yeah, that's, that's that's the equivalent of wisdom as wise as a serpent, recognizing the world for it as it is. Because if you don't do that, you can never turn it yeah. into what you might want it to be. I think. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Jill. Thanks for sharing that. Well, and thank you for the work that yeah. you. Chula, Mississippi. I remember it very, very well. You know, it's interesting because that began in the 30s as a New Deal co-op uh, agricultural project. Uh, and so it's one reason that community was as together as it was in the 60s. It's an interesting, interesting story. Well, just to break in there, uh, the leadership in Holmes County were farmers. Yeah, yeah. And they could be leaders because they owned land. That's right. They had a certain level of independence. Yep. that farm workers did not have. Right. Right. It also made them a source of threat. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'd say that's, a, that's, I'm sure we can talk about those stories for quite a while. Let me see. Do we have some more questions? I wanted to ask a question here. Yeah. May I? Yeah. Uh, may I jump in? Oh, I'm Simon, uh, you're the boss. No. Do you mind? I'd actually, I'd like to get to Carol Mick, who said she'd like to weigh in. So why don't we take Carol said she has a comment, and then this question, and then uh, that should put us just about at time. Yeah. Where's Carol? Hey, yeah, I'm here. Um, Hi, Carol. Uh, what, what you got there, what, Carol? What you, yeah. what you got there? Huh? I have a, a comment about uh, when you talk about the fantasy and what is thought to be reality and and somehow uh something comes in in the middle that yeah uh, that hope has provided uh, a solution that wasn't either side one of the greatest examples i have to put up is um uh south africa with the break breakdown of uh of the apartheid because everybody thought the uh the native africans were going to just wipe out the white whites in a terrible Re reactionary thing and yet they they bit the bullet and try to um resolve all the pain and the issue of that area of that and there, era and area and there was some extraordinary leadership in bishop yeah desmond people. tutu and and uh, nelson mandela and all those mm -hmm. people and uh, it was just those two that kind of started it but there was a had to be a whole lot of more people to to get that thing actualized right that's right yeah. No, thanks for that, Carl. No, we, we have. Please. Yeah, Simon. Go, sorry, go ahead. No, please go ahead. No, no, it's fine. I, just, I believe there's one more question. All right, is that is that Ken? You're muted, Ken. You're on mute. Please, please. <laughs> no, I. this is a dark side, but a lot of us went to jail. Uh, a lot of us got really beaten up. And um, how do you tell young people 
uh, how to deal with that when people get rough and they call you names and uh, they start really dragging on you. I, I guess I guess one is how did we learn to deal with that? You know, how did we learn to deal with it? Um, and you know, it's a lot together. The, the, the bond yeah. we were together. That's right. And the solidarity. Just one of us. Yeah. Yeah. It, no, it was just one. No, the solidarity was a huge part of that. Absolutely. I, I think it's uh, it's true. We were also trained in nonviolence. And and I just want to say that, you know, the word nonviolence is a poor word because satyagraha means truth force. It, it's not, and that's what, how Gandhi understood it. Uh, and, you know, we were taught that you never go and say, don't do this. You say, do do this. In other words, you have, you have to have a creative alternative uh, in fighting and in struggle, uh, because it's certainly about struggle, but it's not just don't, don't, don't. And that's the creative challenge, is to find those alternative pathways. Uh, and that's why hope matters. That's why faith can play a major role, uh, because it's our, our capacity to be creators uh, that turns out to be really important in figuring our way through these things. So, yeah, thanks, thanks for that. And absolutely solidarity. Many, 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 many leaders were born out of that uh, that year too. That's right. One That's became right. the mayor of Madison that I knew very well, Paul Sagan. <laughs> oh, I met him. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, he was just born right next to me, right off the street. <laughs> he got his boy. He got his voice in the in the in the movement of what we were doing in, in, in courage of what we, we put forth. Thank you very much. Well, and that's the school in which we learn this stuff is out there doing it. You know, and I tell my students, you have a class, it's just the beginning of learning. It's not the end. Because the way you learn organizing is the way you learn to ride a bicycle, right? You don't study bicyclology. That may not help too much. Uh, you get on the bike. And usually the first thing that happens is you fall. And that's your moment of truth, that you either go and go to bed, you find the courage to get back up, knowing you're going to keep falling for a while because it's the only way you can keep your balance. And that's how we learn. Uh, and, but it takes the courage, it takes the hope, uh, it takes the solidarity to sustain it. And uh, that's why the heart work is just so, so important uh, when it comes to the work of change. Well, I'm afraid we're going to have to leave it there. Uh, Caitlin and I were texting. We agreed we could listen to you talk all day and would be delighted to. But in the interest of structure and staying on schedule, <laughs> yeah. um, we're going to wrap up for lunch. We will be back at 2 o'clock, which will be when we have some awards for folks who've done incredible work over the past year and then some of our afternoon sessions. So, Marshall, again, thank you so much for joining us. Simon, I really Simon, can't offer enough gratitude. Please. Simon, could I just... Uh, yeah, absolutely. Just conclude with a song now. Yes. I'm not, not going to sing because the fourth grade, I was told, please just mouth the words. And that was kind of the end of my singing. But this is a song that Judy Collins recorded in the 60s. And it uses the word freedom because the civil rights movement didn't call itself the civil rights movement. It called itself the freedom movement because freedom is a much, much bigger word than legal rights. You know, it's about power, it's about solidarity, it's about hope, all of this. And the song goes, uh, freedom doesn't come like a bird on the wing, doesn't fall down like the summer rain. Freedom, freedom is a hard one thing. You have to work for it. You have to fight for it day and night for it. And every generation has to win it again. Pass it on to your children, brother. Pass it on to your children, sister. They have to work for it. They have to fight for it day and night for it. And every generation, has to win it again, pass it on to your children, pass it on. And thank you for the opportunity to pass it on. Thanks so much. That's really beautiful. Thank you, Marshall. And Excellent. thank you so much. Good luck with everything. And, and I hope it's not the last time we have conversation. I look forward to it. Yes. Thank you. Absolutely. Well, thank you, thank you again.